Join me on my journey as I explore wealth in all areas of life. I'm your host, Mindy Kinnis, and this is The Lucrative Society. Hey, hey, I'm joined today by someone who is not only a dear friend, he is a mentor to me in business and investing. And in the last year, he's basically become like a big brother, which, as you can imagine, has both its pros and its cons. My guest is Hubert Centers. Hubert, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So I've heard you talk about this story before, and I want to start here for our audience. Where you came from, you said that you basically only had three different career options. Tell me a little bit more about that. It could have been four. Like, so when I was growing, I grew up in uh, Eastern Kentucky. It's called Johnson County, like Paintsville, Kentucky. Usually around there, there's a couple things that you can do. There was one factory in the town called American Standard. Both my mother and my father worked there, which I'm not down on it. That's how they raised me and my brother. I worked there for a couple summers and I hated it because I was putting the same little four. I mean, if you know anything about American Standard, they make commodes, faucets, shower heads, sinks, stuff like that. You've probably seen them wherever you go in the world. I was putting these four same screws and it's like this base plate. I told the the line supervisor, I'm like, look, there's nine different ways I can do this more effectively to get more output. He's like, shut up, kid, do your job. I'm like, I hate this place. And I kept on doing it. I did it for a couple of years. I hated it. I don't see how anybody could do it, but I know some people do do it, right? It just was not for me. I'm like, I could tell out of here. Um, so there was factory factory job work at American Standard. Number two, you could have went into the coal mines, which back in the day, we're talking, I was born in 71. So coal mines were still kicking. They were kind of falling off a little bit. But if you've never been in a coal mine, they're kind of sketchy. Uh, you're under the ground. You're around water, electricity, and potential cave-ins. And plus, you have a really good chance of getting black lung. I was like, hell no. And then the opportunities are just sky high from here. So you could uh, you could have went into the, the marijuana growth business. You could have grown the weed, which I used to work for a survey company, and we would find weed fields, and we would call in the state police, and they'd come in and, and, and destroy them and stuff like that. But I didn't want to do that because I'm like, okay, I'm, I just I was just never into that stuff in high school or in college, so it's just never my thing. Uh, so could have been in the the marijuana business illegally, uh, either growing it or selling it or distribution. I was like, no. Uh, could have, now also really popular is the meth business in Eastern Kentucky, super popular. You can either cook it or sell it. I was like, mm, no. Or you could be in the moonshine business. All three illegal. Yeah. Uh, and I knew if I did one, I would probably be halfway decent at it. I was like, okay, if you get good at this business, the risk is you get caught and you graduate to the university of the federal penitentiary. That's your, that's your ticket for being successful in that business. I was like, no, I'm out of here. So I just left when I was 17 and I started trying to figure out like how people either, I mean, when I was 17, I was just young and dumb and I just wanted to make money and cash flow. I thought that's all, what it was all about all the toys and stuff. So what I did is I would either volunteer or I would pay people to work underneath them as an apprentice and figure out like how that you would make either cash flow or wealth. And what I found, and you, you know, you, you've been in the same masterminds I have, we get access to hundreds of millionaires, tons of them. Most of our friends are right. And a few billionaires. And what I found is they, they all three did three main things. They either owned their own business. They invested in somebody's business if they didn't own it. They invested in the stock market, okay, or they invested in real estate. That that was the main, that was the whole gist of it. Like this guy invested in a business. This guy owned a business. This this chick over here, she invested in stocks. So it was either real estate, the stock market, or business. So I started in business. And when I was in college, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. And it was actually my my dad's dream, not my dream. I was like, well, they're always here on, 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 the, on the land. My dad, his side hustle is he would... Um, he would just mass breed animals, right? Anything like I would be flipping eggs in the morning for like growing pheasants or quail or chucker, or we would breed rabbits or pigeons. Like he would start out with two and we'd end up having hundreds of them and he would just sell them. Like that's, that was his side hustle back in the day. So we had a lot of issues with animals and the veterinarians would come over and help us with them and, and vet bills for mass producing all these animals he was selling or it was quite high. And I was like, well, this can't be that hard. I can do all, basically it's injecting animals with, with medicine, it's not that hard. So I, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I went off to college and I I was terrible in high school, in grade school. I think when I was in the third grade, I just checked out and was like, why do you need no math? That's what a calculator is for. And you I, just, I just checked. Funny. Here's something What's funny, because I've heard you say this before. I also, in third grade, stopped doing my homework. So I just was yeah. done. 
third grade. I don't know what happened to us in third grade that we were like, we're out. Yeah, it's, it's wild. I had, I think my teacher, her name was Miss Butcher. And it was like, if you didn't have your homework done, you had to stand up and take your three, three licks by the paddle before you can go to recess. I'm like, oh, that's all. That's it. Really? I mean, I get beat like at the house, like three licks. <laughs> I was like, that's an easy trade. I'll, I'll trade that all day long. We just had to stay after school or stay in yeah. recess. It's just a paddle and nothing major. Okay. Let's fast forward past third grade to what you're doing now. Okay. All right. What do you want to know? Well, I want to know what you're doing now. You have essentially done those three things. You are in business, you mm -hmm. are in investing and trading, mm -hmm. and you're investing in other people's businesses. Sure. Yeah. So if I had to do it over again, I would probably, because when I dropped out of college, I decided that I was like, all right, I'm just going to drop out of college because I don't have the grades to be a veterinarian. And the only way to hack that in that was to do a lot of volunteer work with other veterinarians and they'd write you a recommendation letter. So what I did is I worked for a bunch of different veterinarians. And then one day we were pregnancy checking a uh, hundred head of cattle. Okay. And this is, it's going to be gross, but this is how it actually works in order. And we were at a dairy farm. So you just got to make sure you know what you're doing and how you pregnancy check a, a hundred head of cattle is you put this big orange sleeve all the way up to the shoulder. You then you lubricate right in you there. Lubricate your entire arm, and you stick your arm up the cast up the ass of a cow and then you shovel out what's in there. And then you palpate, which is just a fancy way of feeling around, seeing how big the fetus is. And you go, oh, she's three, she's six, she's, hey, she's about to pop. I looked over at one veterinarian and he goes, son, why do you want to do this? And I was like, well, you guys make tons of money. You're your own boss. It's just, I just like it. And he goes, I'm still paying off my student loans and all these farmers are my bosses. I was like, that's it. I'm not doing this job. I'm out. So I'm out. So I dropped out of, dropped out of, high, uh, out of college, never graduated. I, and I told my wife, wife at the time, I was like, look, I'm going to drop out of school. I'm going to go start a business and in, in 12 months, I'll make a million dollars. I was way off on the, the, the skill set that I was going to need to do that. It took me way longer than a year. And then I started up a, a little quick lube on wheels, like a jiffy lube on wheels where we would go and service vehicles in exchange for money. And if you had a fleet of 15 vehicles, we would do it. Or if you had a tractor trailer, we would do it. I met this guy as I was doing some middleman markup. So the, the people thought that I was a mechanic because I was changing oil. I was not. I just knew how to change oil. And they're like, hey, we've got an issue with this transmission. Can you take a look at it? I'm like, sure. I drive it over to the local transmission shop and go, hey, what's wrong with this? He goes, oh, it's this. I'll charge you $400 to fix it. You charge your client $800. I'm like, oh, this is easy money. I owed him a lot of money on invoices because he gave me net 30 to pay the invoices. And he said, hey, come on back here. I'm eating lunch. I'm trading the markets. And I'll trade and me and you can talk about these invoices. I'm like, what are you trading? I walk in there and he's got these two big 21 inch cathode ray tubes, the old monitors. I'm like, what are you doing? I watched the cat make $30,000 in like 18 minutes. And I was hooked. I was like, you were like how, how do I do that? <laughs> that's exactly what I said. I said, how in the hell did you do that? Did you do this every day? And can I come back tomorrow? He goes, well, I don't make this money every day. You know, some days I make, sometimes I lose. I was like, okay, can I come back tomorrow? He's like, yeah, you can come back tomorrow. I end up sitting on an upside down trash can on this side of the guy. <laughs> for, for for two or three days. And he's like, we're going to have to get you a chair. I was like, I need a chair. I need a desk. I need a screen. I'm going to work for you. Whatever you want me to do. I just want to learn how to do this. So I did an old school apprenticeship with him for like 18 months. And I helped him co-manage a, a little hedge fund from 25,000 to 868,000 in a little over a year. And then I started doing my own thing. And just, I've just been managing my own money ever since then. I wish if I had to start it over though, I wish I would have invested in businesses before the stock market. Why do you say that? The returns are greater. The risk is greater, but the returns are much, much greater. The largest percentage, the largest percentage gains I've had is as an angel investor, but it's also the most risk. So yeah, I mean, I've heard I mean, you talk about it where you're like, you basically just kiss your money goodbye and expect to yeah. see it. That's why you have to look at it. Yeah. But I didn't have enough money starting out to do that. So what I did is I originally traded first figured out how to make the cash flow in the markets. And then I would take money from that. And in the local area, I would back people. So I was being an angel investor in the local area. And then I, I kind of stumbled on to Kamal and call Mall talk me into investing his fund. I've been doing it ever since. I love that stuff, but it is super, super risky, but it's got the highest returns. I mean, it works like this. Let's say if you have whatever amount of money you have to burn that you can afford to lose, you're going to invest in 10 companies, three or four of them right out of the bat are going to go out of business. Two or three of them are going to just kind of survive. They're never going to thrive. And one or two of them are just going to go moonshot and be worth, a, you know, hundreds of millions or even a billion dollars. We've already had two exits on $2 billion companies so far. 
That does not mean you make a billion dollars. You will make several hundred thousands or millions, depending on how much you put in there. But the returns on that, I mean, the, I think the largest return we got was like 70,000 X or something like that, just because we got issued some cryptos in a business that we invested in and they gave us the crypto coins and then we just cashed out. We've invested in Slack, all kinds of other companies and stuff like that. It's super exciting, but it's super risky. Okay. So the premise of my show is that wealth is about so much more than just money. And I would oh, like yeah. to hear from you, what is your definition of wealth? So I really don't judge anybody based upon how much money they have. I, I judge them based on, on their character and how they are as a human being. Like, I don't, I don't care how much money you have. If you're an asshole, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Right. If you're dirt poor and you're a good person, you and I can hang, we can have a beer together. So for me, the wealth is more about the journey of what you've gone through that you can show another person that they can potentially do. If, if, if another human has done something on this earth now within reason, like I'm not going to be able to dunk a basketball. Okay. It just, I, know, it's not I always happen. wanted to be in the NBA. It's not going to happen though. <laughs> not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So I don't look at that. Like if there's something that's within the realm of possibilities, like I'm not going to dunk a basketball. I'm not athletic. I'm not going to be in a professional football player or something like that. But in the business world or in the investing world or any other thing, you can probably replicate what they're doing. And believe it or not, they'll probably help you. If you'll go add value to their life and go, hey, how did you do that? Is there something that you need to need to have done that you don't want to do? Because I'll do it in exchange for you teaching me what you do for a living. You'd be surprised like how many people that just come over to the office and I'll tell them everything I know about trading. Like, hey, here it is. Here's a bunch of courses. Here's this. They're like, hey, go do this first. And I'll try to educate them because I'm not going to be able to there's a difference between mentoring and handholding, right? I can mentor you and tell you like, hey, do this first, do this second, do this third. You're still gonna have to make some of the mistakes and eat some of the losses and going, oh, I see what you're talking about on that type of thing, right? You tell me um, that all the time. You're like, you're the one trading, not me. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I, you never take, as a financial guru, you never take credit for somebody else's success because you're not clicking their, you're not clicking their button for buys and sales. They physically have to do it. Well, I would say that's any type of guru, whether you're life coaching, spiritual coaching, financial coaching, anything like I, I can't stand when people take credit for someone else's work. Yeah. Yeah. You put the work in if you're making money. And for me, as far as trading and investing, I really don't care what people do as long as they're making money. That's all I really care about. I don't care what they trade, how they do it, as long as they got good risk to reward ratios. And as long as they're, you know, using stops and protecting Hold on, though. you know you care a little bit you were very explicit with me about not trading certain <laughs> certain things well if it's super dangerous if it's super dangerous like hey be careful with this this thing will rip your face off i will try to guide people around that yes yes and some people should listen to you a little bit more so that's, okay. that's how you learn right? that's how you learn that's how you learn so you and yeah. i have something in common that i want to talk about because i feel like it's not talked about as much in the in the greater business world. And that is, I think you called it in a recent text, a hermit loner. <laughs> we both are oh, yeah. hermit loners, but in the kind of greater business world, people will tell you, oh, you've got to be at this thing and you've got to be in all the masterminds and go here and do all these things. Now, I don't agree with that. I don't think you do either, but what would you say to people who are hearing that constantly like this is what you have to do to be successful well i would say first what is your personality and style first right like if you try to put me like i've, I've been on stage with some really cool cats giving talks at with oprah renfrey's boyfriend and, and and rock stars and stuff like that That stuff's cool but it really doesn't move my needle like it doesn't excite me like oh, great figure out what type of are you good do you want to be the person on the stage or can you be okay being behind the curtain right Believe it or not, there's still a ton of shit that has to take place in a business, even if somebody's a guru on the stage, right? Oh, yeah. And some and a lot of that stuff behind the stage is just as important as the front of the stuff. Absolutely, it is. Now, I am a hermit. Just I've been to a lot of masterminds. I was one of the original investors with Ryan and Perry in their business and stuff like that when they raised capital for digital marketing. Me and one of my partners were. And I've been to a lot of the masterminds, the 25,000, the hundred K stuff like that. It's good. But at some point you have to actually go execute some shit, and just quit networking. Right. And then a lot of uh, some of those masterminds and stuff are good, but they're not great. It's good when they're small, when they get too big, it gets to be, you don't get as much rubbing shoulders and actually swapping stories and actually helping each other. Right. One of the things that I don't like at masterminds is 
let's say you paid $25,000 to be in a mastermind. And then somebody's got a book and go, hey, here's my book. It's $12. I'm like, dude, I just paid $25,000 to be here. I'm not buying, buying that book for $12. Just give it to me, right? That type of thing. If, if I'm in a mastermind and there's other people there that are clients of the mastermind, I will give people access to my stuff. Like, hey, here it is for free. You've paid $25,000 to be here. I'll give you my stuff for free. Me and you are going to be buddies anyway. We're going to help each other. I don't think you have to be in the public eye to be a guru and help somebody. All you have to do is you have to have a skill that you know a little bit better than somebody else. It's just like high school, right? Freshmen think sophomores are, are killer. Sophomores think juniors are all about it. And everybody thinks the seniors hung the moon, right? So a senior can tell a sophomore how to do something and change their journey through high school. It's the same thing. Like I know how to invest in businesses. I know how to trade and invest. I know how to run a profitable business. It's very easy for me to help other people do it by just going, hey, I would do this, I would do that. Hey, have you thought about this? You can still be a hermit and make tons of money either online or if you don't want to have an online business, you can do it, you know, in your local area. Okay, so I have this acronym that I ask all my guests called HERB, H-E-R-B, and I want to go through it with you. So H stands for habits. What are some of your habits? I know you're doing the, uh, what is it, hard? 75 75 hard? Yeah. 75 hard, no? Um. It's a neat little program to go through. I've tried it three times unsuccessfully. I, hopefully I'll get it this time. Habits that I successfully do all the time is I'm always doing at least two or three hours of deep work. And I try to focus on the stuff that I actually like doing. A lot of people like, there's this adage that people are like, hey, you need to find your passion. Well, that's great and all. But if somebody won't pay you for your passion, how are you going to make a living at that? Like, I don't think people will pay me to sit on the couch and eat pizza and watch great movies. I don't think I can turn that into a business model. If I could, I would, but nobody's <laughs> going to pay me for that. So, I mean, I'm really passionate about that too, but it's never going to work, right? So 90, I would say 70 to 90% of the stuff that I do on a day-to-day basis, I don't really like or enjoy doing, but it still has to get done. Now, I enjoy teaching and helping others. Believe it or not, I get more jazzed up about doing that than if I made a hundred grand on a trade. I'd be like, oh my God, this person just made their first thousand dollars. That's going to excite me more than me making a hundred grand. So let me, I'm going to segue from my own question for a second, because something that I have seen you do amazingly, and I would say you're such a great example of this, students that come through my program and they're learning how to figure out starting a business, growing a business, I'm always talking to them about consistency. And a lot of us, myself included, we kind of get bored with doing the same thing. And you put out videos almost every single day. And I don't even know how long you've been doing that. Probably a long ass time. Talk Mm -hmm. to me about consistency. So I think it is the most important thing. Like I would, would you rather, let's say, let's say you were, so I listened to a good podcast today about people like working out and trying to lose weight. Right. And a lot of people like they may have a hundred pounds on, they come into the gym, like, Hey, I want to drop this in in two months. You're like, how in the love of God are you going to do that? Now, if you consistently do something, it will it will melt off of you, right? But it's going to be consistent. It's going to take a long term. I like doing stuff with a marginal gains. Just make a little small increment and keep on doing it and consistently do it. So for the videos that you asked about, I've been doing them for 20 years. And I do anywhere from three to eight videos every single day, 365 days a year. Now, I, there's a little hack to that. On Friday, I record Saturdays and Sundays and they're, they're queued up to go out, right? But yep. Monday through no. Friday, I'm doing... You, you see them all the time. I just knock them out, but it's because I'm into this stuff, right? Like if I wasn't into this stuff, it'd be very hard for me to do that in order to force myself to do that. I don't know. I would say that's still a level above most people because even when they're into it to do something every day like that, I, I mean, props to you. That's awesome. And like I said, you're a great example of that. So I wanted to ask you about that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's get back to the HERB acronym. The E in HERB stands for environment. And you have kind of an interesting setup. But tell me mm-hmm. about your, your home office. So the top of my house is all home and the bottom of my house is all business. So it's, um, it's, a, it's basically a basement. Uh, it's, a, it's a weird basement. Like you haven't been here yet, but I know you end up coming here. I've got a secret room in my basement and there is a, there's a, a bookcase door. Oh, seriously? A- this is so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a video of it on YouTube. One of my buddies came and recorded it. Uh, Todd Gordon. I'll send you a link to it because you can. Oh my gosh, that's awesome! 
So, so, so you, uh, the reason I did it is because the first house I was in, my office was in my bedroom and I would always yell at my kids like, all right, dad's doing videos. Everybody shut up for 10 right. minutes. Let me. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to build a soundproof studio in my basement or in my house. So what I did is there's about, I think it's about 1500 square feet that one office is. I'm in the smaller office right now, but it's a, a secret door. And then there's screens everywhere and just computers and stuff like that and lights and cameras. And then downstairs, there's a, a living room, a, a little kitchen, a bedroom, uh, a gym, a sauna. Just It's just all business, but it's just like I stay down here and work. I go down in the morning when it's dark. I come up in the, in the evening, it's dark, and just I'm just down here working all day long. Being your, weird. your hermit loner self. Now, yeah, yeah, post-pandemic, yeah. I know your staff used to come over to that office, to your house. Do they do that mm -hmm. now, or is everybody working from home? No, everybody works from home now, which I like when people come to the office. I think we, we communicate more effectively. Like, it's hard to do stuff on Slack or Asana or Zoom, but we do a lot of it. I think you can still be effective doing that way, but you have to really up your communication skills in order to do that. It's very easy to stand up like, hey, man, I need you to do this, that, and other thing where they're sitting right next to you. It's easier. The online stuff's a little bit harder to do. You have to up your game on the communication. So I'm the only one here now. Everybody's working from home. Nice. So the R in HERB stands for resources, and resources could be books, programs, mentors, whatever type of resource. What are some resources that have been super impactful to you and that you would recommend to others? So I'm a research nut. I'm a huge advocate of the self-help movement. I mean, I think I read Robin's book when I was 17, like the Tony Robbins stuff. I got hooked on that stuff, went through all that, that jazz. And then, but you, you, you get burned out on that fairly quickly because a lot of it's foo-foo stuff, right? And it's like feel good stuff, but not really follow through an execution. Like, okay, this is good stuff, but how do you actually execute and get this shit done? But now what, right? <laughs> but now what, right? So you get all hopped up and then you go home. You're like, oh, ran out of gas. So I'm a huge advocate of reading audiobooks and, and YouTube videos, any of that stuff. Figure out what you're into. And I don't think it really matters what you do. Just try a bunch of things until you're like, oh, I think I could, I think I could be interested in this for a very long time. And then you can figure out if you can make money with it. So what would you say would be some of maybe your favorite books or the ones that have the most lasting impact on you? So mm, what is the um, mindset by Carol Dweck? Whether yep. you're a fixed mindset or a growth mindset, that's a lot of people's problems. Man, it was my problem before I read that book. And then I was like, oh, this is me. <laughs> it's a good book. It's a good book. Um, I'm going to look on my iPhone really quick because it's Audible. I spend a ton of time on Audible. Uh, the Rational Optimist is a good one. Mm -hmm. Influence, Cialdini. Yeah. Mm, Atomic Habits is really good. Oh, see, I thought that one was just okay. Oh, you don't like it? I love it, but mindset. Let me be clear. I, I yeah. did not say I didn't like it. It just, I don't know. I felt like it was kind of obvious. Like when I read that, I'm like, yeah, okay, nothing new here. Right. You know what? The one thing I picked up out of the book, though, is your environment is just as important as your actual drive. Like if you can put apples on the countertop versus apples in the, the crisper drawer in the refrigerator, you're going to eat more apples and stuff like right. that. Environmental design is huge. If you'll design your environment, so it's, so that's a good good question. Back to the videos, how am I able to do so many videos so consistently? You know why? Because I have a forty three inch screen here, a forty three inch screen here. I have a professional mixer, a professional microphone. Everybody's like, "Hey, how do you sound so good?" On I'm like, "Look, if I got to do this shit every single day, I'm going to have the best tools in order to knock this out." Now I don't do a lot of face videos because I'm self conscious because I think I have a face for radio, so I just do all screencast videos. Plus, I don't think traders want to see me anyway. I think they want to see. The trader porn, which is the charts and the price going up and down anyway, that they don't want to look at, you know, my face while I'm talking. They won't look I at the will charts. tell you something. I will tell you something. They actually do want to see you. I just hate it so bad. I yeah, just you I, can choose I guess whatever you want. I'm just telling yeah. you from the other side, like people actually do enjoy seeing you. So yeah. But that's why like I set it up so that the fr it's frictionless to do a video for me. If I had to set up all this stuff and then hit record. Oh my God, it would drive me batshit crazy. But if I've got a system, I can knock these out like boom, 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 real, real quick. Because I just come in here, I flip one switch, everything's on, computer's on, I go to record. Awesome. So the B in herb stands for beliefs. And what I want to know is what are some of your core beliefs or the ways in which you see the world that have contributed to the success that you have? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a deep one. Like I, I grew up, 
not poor, but like lower middle class. So I always had a chip on my shoulder. So I was always of the opinion, like if somebody ever told me, I'm not, a, I'm not a real good guy to like, Oh, you're doing such a great job. I'm like, don't tell me that shit. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. You know what I'm saying? So if somebody goes, ah, you could have done this, this, and this better. I'm like, dear God, thank you. That's the type of feedback I need. Now, if somebody tells me like, kid, just sit down here. You can't do this. I'm like, mm, have a seat. I'm gonna have to work on this, but I'm about to show you that I can do this. So that's kind of how I'm wired up. I don't know if it's a normal thing. Maybe it's a poor Kentucky thing. I'm not really sure. It's kind of weird too. Like if, if you're not messing with somebody as far as a friend goes and like talking shit to them and, and, and razzing them and giving them a hard time. I usually don't care about them. Like if I don't joke around with them, I don't like them at all. Uh, I know that's what I was referring to when I said the big brother aspect has both pros and cons, (laughs) the amount of shit that I get, Mm -hmm. but also that I give back. So it's all good. (laughs) I don't know. I think, I think that if you can fix your mindset, like making money is not that hard. What is hard is you getting out of your own way and and stop believing the bullshit story that you keep telling yourself, right? Like, oh my God, I have this or I have that. Like, look, you're just you're just lying to yourself because you're really scared. You're scared because you're gonna fail. Okay, what's the first thing that's gonna happen when you start a business? You're probably gonna have to make sales calls. That's not gonna go your way all the time. And if you really understand what's on the other side of fear, it's nothing. Like nobody, nobody really cares about you. They're 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 busy in their own shit, dealing with their own issues. They don't really care what you look like on camera, right? Bingo. I think they do because I, I I still have a hang up on that. And I'm like, eh, I'm still effective without the camera in my face. I'll do the screen video, right? But look, it's all just fear. It's all fear. fear. If you can get past the fear of doing the stuff that you're scared of, uh, you'd be surprised what you can do on the other side. Okay, so tell me this because I know how people in this world think and they hear you say something like, oh, like just fix your mindset, you know, handle that. And the next question they have is, okay, well, how, how do I do that? What would you recommend? I would first read that book mindset. Are you a growth mindset? Or are you fixed mindset? If you're fixed mindset, you can actually change and be a growth mindset. You should, you, you should have the belief that hey, if someone else has done something on this world and you're willing to put in the time and the effort, you might not have the same result, but you'll get close or you'll do substantially better. It just depends because you'll put your own spin on it. And then once you get to that, I mean, it's just really not that hard. It's, it's, it's not that hard. You just have to grind it out. You, just have, you have to be willing to put the, put the work in, right? I'll give you an example. I'm going to use um, my kids as an example. My oldest daughter is a personal trainer and she's really into that. She's building up her clientele and stuff like that. None of them want to trade, none of them, but I've always taught them like, not so much that you can do anything, but like, we don't care what other people think about us, all right? Because if we do, we're not going to act because we're going to be feared that we're going to be judged. Like, so I always tried to instill in them like, look, we don't care what other people think about us. Unless they're cutting a check for our mortgage, if you still have one, they don't get a vote. Now, if they're cutting you a check to pay your mortgage, then they get a vote and saying what you're going to do, right? But if they don't, they don't. So, and then my middle child is Morgan. She's got a successful photography business. My son, he has a 3D photo business. None of them want to be trading. And I tried to get them. I was like, Hey, you want to look at this? They're like, Nope, don't want any part of that. <laughs> no, I do but not. They all are doing. Things. Yeah. They're like, no, I do not want to have any part of that. I see how stressed it is. But I mean, they were all scared to do those things, but they went and did them because it took me forever to train out of them. What society will tell you like, Hey, you should care what other people think. And you really don't, you should, you should do what makes you happy. And you can usually believe it or not, figure out a way to make a profit on that. Now, it's not going to be, I love what I do, but I hate about 70% of it. I don't enjoy it. There's only about 30% of it that I really, really enjoy. But that other 70% has to get done somehow. And I have to do it too. So, so Hubert, if people are interested in learning more about what you do or watching your free videos, where would you like them to go? You can go. So I'm going to spell my name because it is crazy hard to, it, they'll spell not, it. Not hard. Yeah. You don't think it's hard? No. So just go to hubertcenters.com. Centers is spelled with a S. S E N T E R S. Just go to hubertcenters.com. You can look me up and just opt in and I'll start sending you free videos. I will link to that as well at lucra.com. So if you find the spelling difficult for whatever reason, you can just click on the link and we'll go check out hubertcenters.com. I have, I have some questions for you. All right. What questions do you have for me? All right. So. What is the top three things that your audience usually asks from you that you could help them with? 
what's the number big three main things that your audience are always asking like over and over and over again that they struggle with one how can i make more money okay two how can i start a business okay and three is more about the the challenge that they come up against of like i don't know what to do next what should mm-hmm. i do next type mentality that's that would be number 3 gotcha gotcha do you have programs to fix the the, the majority of those of those three things why well, actually yes i do all right so what are they and how do they work so the main one would be lucrative coach and mm-hmm. that literally is soup to nuts so people say hey i'd like to become a coach I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I don't know how to get this thing going. It takes them all the way through, not only just learning how to coach, but how to set up a business and how to make it sustainable. Cause that's all the crap that I screwed up in the beginning. Gotcha. That would be one example. It, do you find that people, when they start out business, do they like to play business instead of actually do business? Like 100%. I got to have, I got to have a really good, pretty logo. I have the, got to have the I greatest name. business <laughs> card. <laughs> Yeah, I, got, I got to spend four weeks designing that business card. God forbid. You know listen, what you should do? You should listen. pick up the phone and make a sales call. Right. But that was me 14 years ago. I totally sure. thought that those were all the important things. So now I really actually like it when people come to me with that kind of stuff. Cause I'm like, mm, let me tell you what happens. If you focus on that, you end up in bankruptcy court. So let's nope. not do that. Let's go a different route. Here's what you're going to do instead. All right. Another follow-up question. I know you've been trading and investing. What are your, what is your biggest major win? Your <laughs> biggest, not, 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 not profit wise. Just like talk about a trade. What's okay. the, what's the a really good trade that you did yeah. that you're proud of? And what's one hard lesson that you learned from a loss? You don't have to, you don't have to do figures. Just say, Hey, I, I was long. We're, we're going to talk about it. So my, my biggest win, I would say actually wasn't even the biggest money amount. It was, mm-hmm. so the woman that I first learned how to trade from her name is Terry Igioma. And she had this program called $1,000 in a day. Like if you can make $1,000 in a day, that's pretty badass. So I had literally just started trading in January and within, it was either two or three weeks, I had made that thousand in a day, which I will add was based on one of your videos. So I totally got that from you. Like I learned how to trade from her, but I got the the insight from you and making that $1,000 in a day when I felt like, wow, I just started this. I don't even really know what I'm doing. That was amazing. So I would say that was my biggest win, even though, like I said, technically number wise, it wasn't the most financially. Right. Biggest loss <laughs> is real, real recent. And here's what happened. I, I had made some bad decisions and then I kind of compounded bad decision on bad decision and okay. let things get a little too far removed. Yep. Ended up with a very, very, very big, let's say, let's just put a number on it, 50% of my account, which is massive. Like that's, I mean, not the the number is massive, but 50% of the account is a massive loss. And here's the interesting thing though, is what I found is that it wasn't so much about the loss, like, cause really if I would have stayed with that trade, it went back up. So I would have lost less. Okay, I could focus on that. But really what I focused on was, you know what? You shouldn't have been in this situation in the first place. Right. And looking at what happened to create that situation, that to me was way more powerful. Yeah, it, it, the hard thing is, and a lot of people can't recover from a 50% loss if they don't figure out what, what caused the 50% loss, right? It's, it's a very common thing where you start out with a little bitty, little itty bitty loss, like a little spoon. And, and then at the end of the day, it's a backhoe it. just digging a hole. <laughs> yeah, I was like, say a no. shovel, but a backhoe is way more apt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're like, dear God. And then you're looking up like, how in the hell am I ever going to get out of this hole? It happens to all of us. Every single body in the in the business, we, we have drawdowns. Nobody really talks about them because they're not sexy, but we all experience them. Well, it's the same thing in any business. You know, like I feel like a lot of my platform has been talking about living out of my office, having my house foreclosed, being evicted from my apartment, filing bankruptcy. Like I'm very right. open about all that stuff. And I think people feel more comfortable with their own mistakes or their own missteps. Once I've been like, yeah, I've done all that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think it's, I think it's kind of funny. Like in the cancel culture that we're in right now, 
at what point in time did we get to an evolutionary standpoint where we're all supposed to be fucking perfect and nobody's supposed to make a fucking mistake? When did that I happen? Know. I mean, I don't even exist in that world. So who cares? Yeah. Like, I yeah. don't pay attention to it at all. It's interesting. I think I, I learned the most from the mistakes. The successes don't really teach you too much. The failures teach you way more than the successes do. Oh, yeah. If if you're willing to learn, I mean, right. what happened? So even in this recent big loss that I had, here's what I did. I didn't react emotionally. It was kind of like, wow, that's interesting. I closed my computer. I went out for a hike and then I came back and I'm like, back to the books, back to studying. Right. Well, cool. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? No, that's it. I was just wondering. Just wondering. Hubert, thank you. I wanted to tell you how grateful I am that my husband developed a friendship with you because I really feel like his friendship with you, like we knew each other, we were friendly, but mm-hmm. I feel like his friendship with you set up the friendship that we have now. And that to me has been life changing. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it. I love that little fella and I I love you too. And you know, I'll do anything to help you out if I can. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure to subscribe to the Lucrative Society on iTunes and please leave a review of the podcast. Visit lucra.com for transcripts and resources or to become a member of the Lucrative Society where I coach purpose-based entrepreneurs on business, mindset, and heart set. Lucra, where wealth equals well-being.